Hi, my name is Paul Isaac. I'm a molecular and cell biology major from Storrs, Connecticut. And this summer, I did research on the horseshoe crab immune system, particularly its clotting response and the clotting factors responsible for it. So to start off, what exactly are horseshoe crabs? Well, for one, they're not actually crabs or even closely related to them. They're actually more closely related to spiders and have been on Earth for over 450 million years, making them literal living fossils. There are four known species of horseshoe crab, three of which, which can be found in East Asia, and one, Limulus polyphemus, which can be found right on the southern Connecticut coast and is also the species that I focused my research on. Horseshoe crabs are also extremely critical to their food web and the biomedical industry. As you can see in this food web, horseshoe crabs and their eggs are an important food source for many org organisms. And then they're also extremely critical to the biomedical industry as they are drained of up to 70% of their blood in order to isolate valuable clotting factors that are eventually processed into a sterility test called Limulus amoebocyte lysate. This test is used to screen a variety of pharmaceuticals as well as biomedical equipment to make sure that it doesn't have any contaminants and it will also be used in the creation of potential COVID vaccinations. So now I'll dive into the immune response behind this sterility test. So the immune response begins in the horseshoe crab's blood, specifically the cells in their blood called amoebocytes. And these amoebocytes contain the clotting factors that I'm investigating. These clotting factors are especially sensitive to a compound contained in the cell walls of gram-negative bacteria called lipopolysaccharides, or abbreviated to LPS. When this LPS enters the bloodstream, it triggers this whole protein cascade that you can see here, with the big players being this clotting factor C, which is actually sensitive to that LPS, and eventually resulting in a clotting response that creates a sticky situation for all the bacteria involved that looks a bit like this. However, the horseshoe crab immune system is not just sensitive to bacteria, it is also sensitive to the presence of fungi, particularly a compound that they have called 1,3-beta-D-glucan, which triggers a different factor called factor G that initiates the same clotting response. So this whole pathway is present in the Limulus amoebocyte lysate sterility test that we use that is obtained through bleeding. Although there is a synthetic version of this, called RFC or recombinant factor C. This only incorporates the C factor protein, which means that it doesn't have the sensing potential of conventional LAL as it can only detect bacterial contamination. So the overall goal of my project for the future is to create a more accurate synthetic for recombinant factor C by especially capturing factors B and factor G to give the synthetic the coverage that recombinant factor C lacks. The method that I'm using to do this for this specific, um, specific summer project is to get a better understanding of this whole immune pathway and especially find the genes responsible for some of these proteins. So the data I was able to use in this whole process is derived from one of the foundational principles of biology, which is the central dogma. The central dogma basically states that DNA is transcribed into RNA which is then translated into the proteins or clotting factors that I'm looking for. By pulling data of protein sequences for these clotting factors from other species of horseshoe crabs and combining this with a assembly of RNA in the blood of the specific species I'm looking at, L. polyphemus, in the form of a blood transcriptome, as well as a compilation of all the DNA um, in L. polyphemus in the genome, I was able to reverse engineer my way through this central dogma to eventually find the genes for these protein sequences starting from the sequences. And now the methodology of how I did this was in a two-phase approach. The first phase being a gene triangulation process in which I was able to slowly work my way from detecting which chromosome these genes might be on, potential areas in the chromosomes they might be on, and then lastly the potential gene that might be responsible for these factors. However, when my mapping results were not as definitive as I wanted, I turned to sec the second phase in which I assembled a new transcriptome through this process that I will go into detail later about um, to basically get a better transcriptome to help with this initial triangulation process and more definitively find locations for these factors. But for right now, let me jump into how phase one went down. 
So phase one began with me searching the genome for these protein sequences using a little program called tBlastN. So tBlastN works a little like reverse Google imaging search, which basically means that instead of inputting an image or an image URL, I'll input protein sequences, and then BLAST will hit me with a chromosomal location for these sequences instead of a website that the image might be found on. So this is a visual representation of how the whole search process went down. So what you're looking at are the 38 chromosomes that comprise the genome of L. polyphemus, and in them we were able to find eight chromosomes that had parts of them matching the protein sequences that I inputted, which you can see here going into detail. I also included not just the factors, but other proteins in this whole immune pathway just to see if they were present in the genome and the transcriptome. And it's important to note that the first half of these, the factors listed here, are what's really important to the sensing part of this whole immune pathway, and the remainder of the proteins are just involved in the clotting process. For making the synthetic, I'm really only interested in these sensing proteins, which are B factor, C factor, and the two alpha and beta subunits of the G factor. So after this step, I mapped the blood transcriptome we had back to the genome, which further confirmed that all the places that I had identified on the chromosomes um, as being a match to the protein sequences also had RNA coding out of them, which again improved the confidence that these were potential locations of genes. However, in my, third, in my third phase of this step, things went a little awry as when I used a statistical software called StringTie to calculate the potential of a gene being in those exact regions, I was only able to find definitive gene locations for two of the regulatory or intermediate proteins in the pathway, specifically being coagulogen and hemagglutinin. And this was disappointing as none of the factors were found, but found to be somewhat confirmed. And so in order to remedy this and get better potential future results is when I moved on to phase two of this process, which is building a new transcriptome for better use in this mapping. So the samples that I used to build this transcriptome came from the various institutions listed here, and all the samples are color coded um, to those institutions. And to just briefly outline the samples that I used, I used central nervous system tissue um, from the horseshoe crab, as well as body or somatic tissue from both male and female horseshoe crabs, as well as their respective egg and sperm. I took RNA samples from their legs, and lastly, from their embryos. And now I'll show you a visual representation of the whole process of what constructing a transcriptome looks like. Listed here are all the samples, and again, color-coded by their institution. And now I'll get right into it. So first of all, the data that I get is in these form of these two paired transcripts um, for each sample. Then through software, I take them over and I trim them to get rid of any um, less, uh, less valuable data that is um, not probable to contain the actual RNA sequences that I'm looking for for these specific parts of the horseshoe crab. And then these trim sequences are assembled into one big sequence. Then from there, the assembled sequences are taken and protein coding regions are identified and isolated. Then these isolated regions are taken into a clustering step in which they're smushed together in order to get my final assembled transcriptome. When I did statistical analysis of this transcriptome, I was able to determine that it is 96.2% complete, which means that it's pretty good for the work that I've put in. Unfortunately, I have not been able to get to the actual process of using this transcriptome in the uh, gene triangulation process, but that is something that I'll be discussing in my next steps later on. So the results and implications of the research that I've done is that I've been able to confirm the locations for coagulogen and hemagglutinin, which are located on this diagram with the green checks next to them. And then general locations for the other factors were also confirmed, again, located with yellow checks. So the implications for this is that coagulogen and hemagglutinin might be continuously expressed in the blood, as in they're always present due to their role as regulatory elements. And the reason why I could not find the factors in the transcriptome might be because they're only expressed when the horseshoe crabs are actually responding to a pathogen. The second result I found is that I was able to determine two match locations for factors B and C. However, I was only able to find one potential gene location for the other factors marked with the yellow checks. And the implications for this are that there are potentially multiple genes for factors B and C, and there might be differential expression or the creation of multiple proteins from one gene, 
for the other genes. And this is especially good news because it means that the existence of another gene for factors B and C could mean that I could straight up improve the current recombinant factor C by determining if those other genes are producing proteins that are more sensitive to those bacterial contaminants than the ones that we currently have. And so for my next steps from here, I wanted to, again, like I said before, reintegrate uh, the new transcriptum that I've made into the triangulation process to get better mapping results from that. And then after that, sequence a blood transcriptome during the clotting response to see if I can use that to pick up the clotting factors in it. And lastly, I'm planning to make a GitLab with my whole um, series of code published so that other people can build a transcriptome using the same data set that I used. Lastly, I would like to especially thank all the people involved in the Holster program, Mr. and Mrs. Holster for their graduates, their um, generous funding of all my endeavors. I'd like to especially thank my mentor, Dr. Rachel O'Neill, and all the lab members that worked with me to help me overcome all the obstacles that I faced in this research. And lastly, I would like to thank Andrew of Weigrizen Lab for providing me with the genome that I used to do all this research. And that is my work cited and